Oh, looky here. We have this uh, this old car here. This ancient car. It's been abandoned for like 10,000 years. And the car itself has to be at least like 100 years old, I'm pretty sure. You can you can tell that because it's old. It's got these bullet holes here. Like this was probably the car that Bonnie and Clyde were driving. I'm pretty sure because like nobody ever just shoots at old junk cars for fun. I don't think it's got to be. It's got to have some historical, you know, significance for sure. It's not just another junk car. So uh, we're gonna like try to get it to run and drive again because that's the that's the thing to do on YouTube. Like apparently, so I'm told. So look at. This car is so old that like it doesn't even have upholstery. Like people, people's high knees were a lot tougher back then. They didn't need upholstery, so it's just like these uh, these metal things here. They're kind of springy. It's actually kind of comfortable. Like if you don't get poked, I mean. But other than that, it's pretty comfortable. And you can see there's like holes here. Those aren't supposed to be there. Most of them, anyways. And it's just it's very old, very old. Okay, so here's like the engine, right? Um, and the previous owner, he told me this thing was running recently. So it shouldn't be too bad to get it going. Uh, these are my tools here. I put them there in case you were wondering. But uh, you can still see his, his uh, gas tank here and the fuel line. And there's still some gas in there. So uh, yeah, it's got gas in it. So only issue is over the winter, water leaked through the holes in the hood. And there's some water around the spark plugs. I have to steal a battery out of my daily driver because I'm kind of a bum and I only got one battery. We got like 10 vehicles here and only one battery. What a loser. Same one of them big fancy channels where people buy me batteries. I gotta, you know, make do with what I got. Ain't got no sponsors. Understandably, I wouldn't sponsor me either. Here I am soaking up the water around the spark plug holes. It doesn't look like a whole lot of water made it in. And at this point, I'm still very optimistic that this is just going to be a kind of a gimme and it's just going to fire right up. So I'm hooking up the battery cable here. And uh, I do recall something. We'll get to that later. But I'm going to check and see if the engine spins over now because that seems like a good idea. And it does not. The engine is quite tight. So that's not very good. And now we're gonna just pull the spark plugs out to see if any water made it past. And we look, had a good look inside there and it doesn't look like anything got inside the engine. But uh, that doesn't change the fact that it's not wanting to spin. But I do recall that the previous owner said that the starter is now ruined. So I thought maybe there's some chance that uh, it's just kind of jammed up against the uh, flywheel. So I figured I'd just throw a battery in it and see if we could get the starter to do anything at all. See if it'll just magically, you know, free itself up. At this point, I was still rather foolishly optimistic that this wasn't going to turn into a two or three day debacle. I thought it was just going to, you know, magically go, seeing as how it was running recently. If you ever want a proof that I'm not the sharpest tool in the shed, here you are. I was puzzling over why there's suddenly antifreeze everywhere after rocking the car over. And uh, that's because there's literally, right in front of my face, a coolant passage coming out of the block and the line is broken off. So there you go. Don't worry though, we got the uh, hose all fixed up there. Good to go. 
At this point, I realized I was gonna have to crawl under the car, decided to remove the starter and bench test it, and also remove the flywheel cover because I noticed it has a bunch of damage. And also check out this sweet old braze job on here. And this is the part where we realized that it was definitely going to take us more than an hour if we wanted to get this car to run and drive again. Clearly it has been submerged at some point and uh, things aren't looking too good in here. Not looking very good at all. And here's another look at Titanic clutch. Clearly been, uh, you know, on some nautical adventures in its time. And not uh, too promising now. So I decided to just dump some goose grease down the cylinders. Just, I don't know why. Just for something to kill time with, I guess. Working on the starter, I pulled off the solenoid here because we kind of diagnosed this is the problem. And I thought you could just pull the end off, but it looks like it's all kind of a contained sealed unit on these Pontiacs. And the only way to break it apart appears to be you have to drill out these spot welds. I'm going to give that a try, and if this isn't the way to take it apart, you can uh, yell at me in the comment section. How about that? Sounds like a deal to me. Now what? I don't really know anything about any of this. I don't really know anything about any of this. I don't really know anything about any of this. But I'm guessing it just needs a really good cleaning. It looks like this thing here just kind of plunges ahead and bridges these two contacts here. And the contacts are dirty and burnt. So I'll just try to clean that up a bit, I guess. I don't know. Uh, basically what I did is I just flipped this stud around so the burnt off side isn't, uh, you know, touching this. And uh, I just cleaned the contacts and that's literally all I did. I don't know what else it could be. Granted, I don't know anything about electricity, but basically this just pushes ahead and bridges the contacts between here and engages the actual starter motor. And like, near as I can tell, that's literally the only thing that could have failed. It's just a bad connection between this and this because the solenoid itself engages when you put power to it. And if you put power directly to the starter motor, the starter motor spins, but I can't get, you know, the thing to actually go out um, when you put power to it in the normal spot. So I think that's, that was the issue, but I guess we'll just uh, find out here. I don't really want to spend any time on this where you got too much time into it. So I'll throw this back together, then we'll give it another test run. How come nobody told me that you're not supposed to remove this thing? All you have to do is remove this simple screw. And this end comes right off and we could have avoided all this extra work. Oh, you guys let me down again. Never an expert when you need one.
So I had to reinstall the gauge cluster so that I would have an oil pressure and a temperature gauge. Someone, for some reason, decided to remove it. And luckily, it's one of the few things that somebody removed from this car that did not get lost to the sands of time. So we're just going to shove it back in here and then we can kind of monitor what's going on if, in fact, this will start. Which, uh, again, we were fairly optimistic that it would start. But, well, you'll see, uh, I guess, what's coming up here. And uh, we were definitely a little premature on this. So while I had the starter out to fix the solenoid, I had a thought that I should take the starter apart and clean it out and get it to uh, maybe, you know, see what's going on inside of it. And of course I didn't do that. And what you're seeing now is the, uh, I believe it's called Murphy's Law. And what's happening is every time I go to start that engine and it starts to catch and fire and spin faster, it kicks the starter back out and... I end up messing around with this for quite a while before I finally bite the bullet and remove the starter again, but that's what's going on. Even though I knew I was eventually going to have to pull the starter off and disassemble it, I decided to kind of start working backwards. Up until this point, I had been doing a lot of assuming, which was getting me in a lot of trouble. So I decided to go back to basics. I pulled off the distributor cap and it turns out everything in there was quite corroded. Even though I had spark, I decided to just clean everything up in there thinking that if I was able to get a bit hotter spark, I might be able to get the engine to pop off before, you know, the starter decided to leave the chat. So the starter abuse went on for quite some time. I tried everything to try and, you know, get it to pop off and it would start to go. But like I said, every time it would start picking up, you know, speed and starting to catch, it would just kick that starter out right when I needed it the most. So we finally just pulled the starter out, which we should have done in the first place, but you know, whatever. If it makes you feel better though, after this whole trying to get this thing running, I went to put the battery 
back in my daily driver because I needed to go somewhere. And wouldn't you know it, I had managed to run the battery down. So serves me right. Well, as you can see, the starter is now out again. And the solenoid seems to be working okay. But the problem is, is as soon as the engine starts to catch and spin faster, it's kicking the starter out. And it's not allowing it to actually, you know, start the car. Which is what we needed to do because it's a starter and that's what it's supposed to do. So I don't know anything about starters. I've never taken one apart before. Just like how I've never taken a solenoid apart before. But I think the way you take these apart is you just uh, cut them open here and then weld them back together. Uh-huh. It looks old. And it also appears to have been underwater as well. Much like the rest of the car. Perfect. That looks pretty crunchy. Crunchosaurus Rex.
So you can see the water line along the side of the driver's side of the car. I'm thinking it must have been sitting at an angle in the water because there isn't this on the other side, but you can also see all these little bubbles along the bottom of the door. It looks like just bumps in the paint or blisters, but you go to poke them and there's a whole, whole door bottom or basically the whole side of this car is rotted along the bottom like eight to uh, 10 inches. So it was sitting in water long enough to rot it pretty bad. But that's just uh, something to look out for on these old cars, not necessarily that they've been submerged in water, but if you see, you know, blisters and stuff coming up through the paint like that, there's a good chance it's going to be a rust hole. Rust comes from the inside out and it will ruin your day. Well, I guess the good news is it runs. Uh, the bad news is I was getting it running so that I could actually drive it, uh, you know, in here when the time comes. But I think with the way that clutch is, it's not going to move. The other uh, bad news is is that uh, it runs like complete garbage. So uh, let me know in the comments. Uh, you know, should we do some investigating on that engine and see if we can get it running better, or just you know leave it the way it is and not even bother? I was kind of thinking about using that uh, flathead in the chicken truck just because it's kind of interesting. But as soon as I have to start dumping money into it and taking it to a machine shop and whatever else that, that has to be done then you know that's it that's not happening that's way out of our budget and way out of uh, the, the plan for this you know I don't have uh, disposable income for that kind of thing so if that engine isn't worth messing with then I'll just stick with my plan of using a Chevy inline six it's a little easier to get parts for cheaper to get parts for and uh, uh, there's a lot more of them out there so that's uh, that's the theory there, but let me know in the comments what you think we should do. And uh, I guess uh, what I should have done, you know, before I did an oil change on it, was probably do a compression test. That would have made a lot more sense just to see what's going on in, inside of it, I guess. And it's definitely uh, it's definitely got some issues, but uh, we didn't do that because uh, I I'm pretty scatterbrained, you know. Just all over the place, always. It's never. You know, just can't focus on anything. I was just looking at this junk starter and found this cool old repair. Like this thing must have been sheared off or something, but you can see where they like brazed it back together. It's all brazed here. That uh, somebody spent some time on that. It's pretty impressive. Old, uh, old fix there. Got distracted again, but uh, you know, what else is new? That's fine though, no big deal. Okay, um, where were we? Yeah, uh, let's get on to the next segment. So here's the test subject. This is a 1953 Chevy truck cab that's been abused and sitting outside for the last 70 odd years. And you can see there's lots of surface rust on it. Lots of heavy pitting in here and over here. That's going to be really difficult to remove, I think. I've already like cleaned a lot of this off with these fiber discs, but you can see all of this staining here. This is all embedded and pitted in the metal. And I mean, there's no amount of grinding and whatever that's going to remove that without damaging the, the metal that isn't rusted. So I need something that'll actually penetrate into here and clean this out. You can see the whole cab is like this. There's this staining where the paint had worn off or peeled off and it rusted and now there's lots of rust. Lots and lots of rust. Now this is not uh, that new freshly applied rust. This is a uh, wholesome old growth rust. This has been on here for centuries eating away at the metal. Now I got a whole cabinet full of rust eaters, greeters and treaters. But what we got here is this new stuff I picked up. It's called Crud Cutter. This is a gel. It's water-based and it does not require rinsing after you apply it. One of our patrons of the show, Ken, suggested this to me and said it works really good for exactly what we're trying to remove here. So we're going to give this new stuff a try and see how it works. I'm always skeptical with this stuff, but... Uh, you know, we got lots of rust and lots of time to experiment, so let's give it a try. So I'm just going to try this on one area first just to see what it does. 
Normally I would start by like sanding this off or using a fiber wheel or something, but I just want to see how good this is going to work, whether or not it gets into here or not. You use a acid brush to kind of smoosh it around. I just only glazed over the instructions. I'm not really into reading. It's just not really my thing. So I'm just kind of guessing here, but I'm guessing you need a kind of a thicker application in order for it to kind of do its thing. let that sit for 20 minutes or so and let it do its thing and some of this heavier rust it says you'll need to apply more than one coat or whatever so you know I suspect this heavy rust in this windshield channel here is going to need a little bit more work it's also still colder in here it I think uh, as with a lot of the this stuff the warmer it is the better it works but I'm kind of impatient, so we're just going to go ahead and start coating these areas on the roof. This is what I'm most interested in, is whether or not it's going to actually bite into this pitting here. I'm fairly confident it'll do some stuff on the cowl there, but... So this is the gel stuff. You can also buy it as a liquid, but if you're doing like uh, stuff like this, I would say the gel is more useful because if you just get a liquid, it's just going to want to run off and uh, make a mess on the floor or whatever. Oh, it's been over 20 minutes and I mean, it looks like it's doing something. So I guess we'll uh, try wiping it off. I don't know. I have no idea. All right, well, uh, you removed all the light rust, but like this heavy rust here, it, it barely even touched it. it. It removed the light stuff, but not the, not the stuff we actually want to get rid of. So this is probably sitting about half an hour. I think we're gonna have to let it sit for quite a bit longer in order for it to do anything. I and mean, it is working, but um, you know, I guess, you know, having it be colder than the recommended temperature probably doesn't help. Like, I would imagine if it was actually warm in here, like room temperature, it would probably work a lot faster. But, uh, yeah, uh, I mean, I'm not totally disgusted with it, but it's just going to take a little bit longer. Give it a, another healthy coat here, and we'll just let this sit for a long, long, long time. I think it'll work, but... Just a matter of finding out how long it has to stay on here to actually do something. Let's see how it's doing on the surface rust. You know it didn't get all of it but it is it is working and I will say that this is uh, working better than any of the other junk I've tried in the past other than muriatic acid but the problem with the muriatic acid is it rusts it flash rusts all the stuff that already is bare metal so um, 
I think uh, it's just going to be a waiting game, just a passive thing. We'll put on another layer, just make sure all these other spots are staying wet and just uh, let it do its thing. So I'm already calling a victory on this stuff. So I went around and just started splodging it on all the rust spots on the cab. Um, yeah, I, uh, here we just kind of scrubbed into here a bit and like that's already gotten a lar large portion of the rust. Obviously it needs, needs more, but, uh, I think, uh, I think I'm calling that a win. So I'll just recoat that area there and just keep making sure that this stays wet and I'll just keep working at it. But, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm really impressed. I just let this stuff set on here for a couple hours now and uh, I guess we'll start uh, poking away at it and uh, see if it actually did something like you can definitely see it's changing color like it looks like it's doing something so I don't know yeah let's uh, continue our science experiment like I said leaving it on for two hours was a big mistake uh, it just made it very difficult to remove and I'm not a scientist, but I think what's happening is you know as soon as it's exposed to the atmosphere it starts to lose its bite so you have to like the instructions say just keep removing it and reapplying it and removing it and reapplying it as needed. I did notice that the spots where I had actually removed and applied the stuff several times had a lot more rust removal action than what I when I just left the uh, stuff on for two hours. So that kind of confirms my theory there. That and it's not helping that it's very cold in here. Much colder than what the required temperature is supposed to be. Alright, well it's actually been about a week since our uh, chicken truck experiment here. But um, yeah, uh, not much has happened. I can't remember what happened last. Uh, I will say follow the instructions. Don't leave it on for like, you know, four or five times the recommended amount because then it's extremely difficult to remove. So I put on another thingy and then I let it on for the recommended amount and then I wiped it off and I haven't touched it since. So it's just kind of sitting here. It's got this kind of coating on it, which is supposed to be like a protective coating. So I'm just gonna sand that off real quick with the dual activity sander. And then once that's done, we'll kind of take a look and evaluate what has been done here and what's happened. We may even try to get some of this yellow off of here, but uh, we'll see. I don't know. I don't really have a lot of time to mess with this. So whatever we get done, we get done. I think it was a fairly successful experiment though. You know, I guess. I don't know. We'll see. Well, the final verdict here is that I'm pleased as punch with how this stuff works. Uh, it really, it did work. I am, I'm, I gotta say I'm impressed. Uh, I got right into the spots where it needed to. Now we are gonna have to go back and do another application of this. You can see, still see there's a few spots, you know, that are kind of, uh, still got some rust in it. So we'll just have to keep going back and just, you know, touching it up here and there, but it's not like this thing is getting painted or primed tomorrow or even next week or even next year probably. So we got uh, lots of time to mess around with that. I'll give it another go, I think in the summer when it's actually warm, like I keep it around 10 degrees uh, Celsius here in the winter and it's supposed to be like over 20 degrees Celsius for the stuff to work in its best, uh, in its best manner possible or whatever you want to say there. So we're, we're colder than the recommended uh, temperature anyways is what I'm trying to say and I think with acids and things like that they work better when they're warmer. Again, I'm not a scientist, I'm just making stuff up. And Now, uh, down here where we had this heavy rust, it didn't uh, really want to bite into that too much. I think what I would do with this uh, is, is rough it up with something, you know, a crud wheel or a wire wheel or grinder or something to knock off the heavy stuff. Because it just didn't, you know, we will get it, I think, if you keep applying and stuff, but this is, this is pretty harsh, so. It's going to take a while to get rid of that, but I think, uh, you know, whatever. Again, I think this stuff is just kind of a passive thing. You just keep working at it. But, uh, you know, for what it costs and uh, how well it works, I'm, I'm just uh, really pleased with how that, how that all came out. And, you know, stuff like this, like even if you were to sandblast it, well, you wouldn't want to ever sandblast anything like this on a roof, a big flat panel. This would destroy it. I don't care what... You know anybody says or you know even the the best 
most experienced sandblasters with doing sheet metal stuff. This would still move, you know, I've seen it time and time again, and it's sometimes not always noticeable until you start getting it prepped for body work and suddenly it's like, whoa, what's going on here? And like it was straight before, but now it's all full of waves and stuff. So I do not recommend ever sandblasting flat stuff like this. So this stuff here, it's passive thing. You just put it on and it, you know, it got right into all those little pits. It's cleaning them out. And that's exactly what we want. I'm, I'm just uh, definitely impressed with that for sure. Like I said, I've got a whole cabinet full of random rust removers and converters and nonsense like that. This crud cutter stuff is the best stuff I've used. A couple reasons for that. Uh, first thing, I guess, is that it uh, does not require rinsing with water afterwards. That's a huge benefit. All the other stuff I've used requires rinsing with water. And you got water and bare metal, well, what's going to happen? It's going to, you pretty well have to get it primed right away as soon as you're done converting it or whatever. This I can just let it sit and it'll probably be fine. I don't know where we're going with this. We're just rambling on. I lost my train of thought again. The only thing that works faster than this is uh, muriatic acid. Problem with that stuff is it rusts everything within a 10 mile radius that you don't want, you know? So it'll remove the rust from the pitting and stuff, but you know, this whole roof would just be completely flash rusted as well as anything else in the immediate area. Everything in the garage right now would be covered in rust. So we got to do it outside and it's super, you know, pretty harsh stuff. Again, I'm not a I'm not a safety guy, not really my thing, but that stuff is, you know, it'll eat your skin, it'll eat your bones, it'll eat your lungs from the inside out. It's just nasty, nasty stuff and I don't like it. So I, I'm going to be sticking with this crud gutter stuff from now on. I, I think for, for what it is and for the cost and everything else, it is the best stuff I've ever used. I don't do product sponsorships or endorsements or any of that junk. Nobody's paying me to say this is good. I had to go to Canadian Tire and buy this myself. But uh, I liked it so much that I went and bought more. And you know what? If I, had, uh, if I hadn't already exceeded my $20, you know, project car budget for the year, I would have uh, bought out the whole store because, uh, you know, something that works this good is most certainly going to be getting banned in Canada at some point because, like everything else that works, it, it seems to disappear off the shelves unfortunately but uh, as of right now yeah it's still available and really we hardly even used any of it we did like a lot of this truck and you know we still got probably you know we only used about that much of it so that's pretty good and you know even just going to the store like if you've been watching for a while you know i i hate going anywhere in public so for me to actually leave here and go buy more that that ought to tell you something. There is just a fun little science experiment and I gotta say thanks again to Ken, our patron Ken there for recommending this stuff. Um, you know, a round of applause for Ken. It's very helpful. That's gonna save me a lot of time and uh, problems, you know, going forward. Now that we have a good, uh, a good quality rust remover product here that actually works good. So yeah, uh, there you go. Hope that helps somebody, maybe or maybe not. Now, you didn't think we were going to do all that work and not see if we could drive that Pontiac, did you? Well, I kind of thought that was going to be the case, but I just, uh, I started editing this video and I, I couldn't uh, leave it alone. I've already wasted two days on that thing, uh, battling back and forth with it. Uh, not because it was particularly difficult, it just due to my own incompetence and lack of knowledge, I guess. But, uh, yeah, let's... Uh, Let's give it a try. Let's see if that thing will drive. Cause you know, we've already wasted uh, two days on it. Let's waste another day. See if we can get to move. So I just clamped the clutch pedal to the floor and then I took my putty knife and I scraped in between the, the clutch disc there and managed to free it up.
that ended up being a whole pile more work to get that thing going than I anticipated. And I guess that's just the way these old car things go. Uh, that uh, that engine needs some work. It's uh, popping and snorting and farting and doing all kinds of nasty things. So I don't know if it's worth trying to utilize and get running better and put it in the chicken truck or if you just uh, toss it out or whatever. Um, I think it is a cool looking engine and it'd be kind of funny to have like a flathead six cylinder in the chicken truck. You know, I'm not building this thing to go fast or, you know, drive across the country or anything. It just has to, you know, run good. And well, I mean, I only put like a thousand miles a year on my daily driver, so it's never going to get a lot of miles on it, but it does have to run good and not smoke and, and be garbage. So we'll see. Like I said, we should have done a compression test on that, you know, probably before uh, wasting a whole pile of time on it. But uh, my fragile ego just couldn't handle any more bad news right now. I think we would have got at least a couple stuck valves and possibly some other issues that are going to come up. So I don't think it's going to, a basic tune up is going to help it, even though it is all the plug wires are basically like, you know, about to turn to dust. Um, but yeah, uh, right now I'm calling that a total victory because I'm not going to have to push that in the garage to dismantle it, to get the parts we need for the chicken truck. So total win there. Uh, anytime you don't have to push a car around is a win in my book. So regardless of how bad it runs, it's going to at least make it a couple feet into the grass here. And so I'm happy about that and we'll, we'll save the bad news for later and, uh, and whatever else it has in store to offer for us. Now I'm not going to just unceremoniously butcher that thing apart to, uh, get the parts I need for the, uh, the chicken truck there. I got a couple of fun little side quests planned for it that hopefully won't take too long or, you know, famous last words, but um, we're going to make sure that car goes out in like a, a blaze of, of glory, uh, I guess you could call it that. You know, I don't want to just unceremoniously cut it apart, even though it, its fate is kind of sealed at this point, but its fate was sealed long before I got it. The car is quite rough. Um, obviously, it's been laying in a swamp and then somebody stole a bunch of parts off it, so that's all it's good for is parts car now and probably I'm going to end up using more from it than if it had uh, gone to a wrecking yard and I'm sure if it went to a wrecking yard they would have just crushed it right off the bat. So is what it is, can't save them all but uh, we'll, uh, we'll have some fun with it before we kill it and that's what's going to be coming up soon is, uh, is some Pontiac adventures which will directly segue into chicken truck adventures. So thanks for sticking with us on whatever the heck that was. Quick announcement before we go, uh, a while back, probably two or three months ago now, I mentioned that my PayPal donation page had been uh, shut down and I was trying to get it back and basically after you know several weeks of messing around, I had basically given up on it, but I just got a notification here a few days ago that PayPal has suddenly reinstated that for me. Um, so I guess when they say two to three days to review my information, they actually mean two to three months, but it is now working again. So we're going to give it one last try and, and hopefully they don't shut us down this time. So if you like, uh, what you're watching, uh, for some reason or another, I don't know why you'd like this, but if you do and you want to support the show and you want to see more on the chicken truck and more on whatever else we're working on, uh, it really does help to if you donate to the channel whether it's through PayPal or Patreon or through the YouTube Super Thanks button. Uh, YouTube was pretty good to me for you know January, February and the start of March and now the views have completely tanked which is understandable because most of you are in North America. I know some of you have backwards weird seasons some of you watching, you guys are watching all over the world, which is really cool. But uh, here in North America and I think other parts of Europe, it's spring now. So people aren't watching as many videos as they do during the winter. So views completely drop and tank. Past couple of years, I've basically taken a couple months off in the summer because it was the views were so bad that I couldn't even justify, you know, the time it takes to put these videos together. This year, I'm really trying to push through that and continue 
doing videos year round, even if it's only two or three videos a month, I really want to, I don't want to take a break. I just want to keep pushing through, but, um, it's going to be really hard to do that if the views, you know, stay where they are. So again, any donations are greatly appreciated and, um, obviously that's not necessary. The videos are still free for everyone to watch. Um, and if you, if you do want to help out and, and obviously a lot of you probably are like me and you don't have a lot of money, uh, the best way to help out is just watch the videos and also just make sure that uh, you have the notifications thing on and you're subscribed, I guess. Um, even if you are subscribed, what, what happens, I've noticed on other channels that I watch, is when the views go down, YouTube won't recommend when I get a new video, they won't recommend it in the recommended section on your YouTube page, whether you're watching on television or computer or whatever. You'll actually have to go down to your subscriptions button and click on that and it'll show all the new videos from the channels you're subscribed to and you have to scroll through there and check and see because they, you know, once my views start dropping, they, they stop pushing the videos and I've had this happen or people tell me that this happens to them as well where they, they watch all my videos and then suddenly there's nothing for like two or three months and then they come back and they see all these videos that they missed out on and they're like, well, YouTube didn't recommend them to me even. So uh, just, I guess, make sure that you're always checking back for new videos. Uh, it really does help to, you know, watch this stuff, I guess, you know, that's just, uh, I'm rambling off again, but uh, PayPal is working again. So if you wanna, you know, help out the channel that way or however you can, I, I, I appreciate all that very much and it, it's going to help me continue to produce these videos otherwise you know it, it's very difficult during these spring and summer months for me to actually make a go of this and we've got lots coming up on the chicken truck and, and lots of big stuff and I really would like to get done in summer but you know I don't want to put a whole bunch of my effort and resources into doing videos if they're not going to be getting the views that I need you know, if, if that's going to be the case, then I have to wait until fall or winter when the views are better to actually do all that stuff that I want to do now. So, uh, again, sorry for the rambling, but uh, that's what's happening. Thanks so much for watching and we'll see you again next week. Mm -hmm.